Hello, everyone. I've, uh, I'm not very familiar with this format or the tool I'm using, so if anything goes wrong, I'll take all the blame. Uh, but we're going to go through a bit of OpenStack and some of the ecosystem and some of the tools. Uh, there should be some time for questions and answers. I'm a little, I'm, I'm more used to looking out over and seeing people's eyes, so it's kind of strange sitting here in a room talking to myself without hearing you guys. But I am watching the group chat, and then when you guys put questions with the queue, then I should see those more explicitly, and we'll just kind of take it as it comes. I just want to reiterate something that Yasmina said, which is that there's probably more expertise in the audience than there is in the speaker, if you, if you add it all up. So I'm sure you guys have things to add. You know, talk amongst yourselves, add comments to the chat. I think that will add to the, to the, the medium. And then I also might take certain things for granted that you know certain things, or if I'm using jargon, I, would, I don't want to move forward if there's something that's really confusing. So if you can pop things in the Q&A that I could explain you know, in a minute, I don't want to rabble hole too bad, then that will help clear up some things. So that's kind of where I want to go with this. As interactive as possible. It's the, it's the Internet, right? That's the whole point of this. So just to uh, – I don't really want to waste too much time introducing myself. There, there's probably a little bit of lag when I was testing this earlier, so I might not have exactly the flow that you guys are seeing. But I, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter, whatever. You guys can read about me. You read my bio, so I did some stuff, blah, blah, blah. That's not why we're here today. And I also would just like to uh, preface this with, uh, if you've ever seen me talk before, it's, uh, it's a bit of a ride, and hopefully uh, it's a fun one. Keep your arms and legs inside at all times. And like I said, it's, uh, it's going to be fun. So I'm not going to waste too much time with definitions of what is cloud computing. I think if you're in this chat, you probably are past the point that you believe that there is something going on, uh, I don't think it's useful to spend time dealing with definitions and taxonomies and standards and all that stuff. I basically want to be able to solve problems and hopefully we can get to the point where you have not necessarily all the answers but uh, better questions. And just to kind of put this in perspective, what I think we're going to accomplish today I'm basically going to, in one hour, uh, save you a few hours worth of reading so that you have about 100 hours worth of reading to do, to be able to, uh, to do some of this. Out reading and, and tinkering and hacking. So what is OpenStack? Let's, let's talk about this. In the beginning, there was an idea. And I'm going to kind of leave the first part of that story off the rise of uh, Amazon Web Services or, or, you know, how we got to the point where we're at today. But Rackspace and NASA released a project called OpenStack roughly 15 months ago, June. Last year, uh, the OSCON, uh, there were some things that obviously went on behind the scenes before that, but that was sort of the, the, the public coming out party for OpenStack. And it turns out that Rackspace had already sort of gone through a first generation of their cloud and come to the conclusion that they wanted to do something different than they were doing. And NASA was trying to solve uh, similar problems. And what I think, if, you really, if you're really following the arc of this story and, and you look at what that, release, that first release of OpenStack was, it wasn't so much that you were getting a cloud framework that was, that was released and ready to be put into production. What I, what I feel it was was a, was a co kind of a social contract that the development of this cloud, this cloud framework, this cloud infrastructure was going to be done in the open. And to that, 
I think you have to applaud the way that, I mean, I won't, I won't necessarily say that there hasn't been some interesting twists and turns to that, but for the most part, Rackspace and NASA have gone out of their way to do what they can to develop in the open. So if you're really following the plot of this story, there's also been kind of a rolling involvement of, of other companies. And these companies that are on the slide that hopefully the lag is not so bad you can see now are basically companies that have in the last year uh, demonstrated uh, through, you know, some involvement in the community with the code, with, with what have you, and also with, with certain sort of um, business-focused activities are, are trying to add value and, and possibly capture value from the, the growing OpenStack community. But that's, that's only a fraction of the story. So there are, I mean, th this slide doesn't necessarily do it justice. When I made these slides last night, I probably left some, some people off here that I should have on here. I know, uh, you know, Mitakura is probably a good one. There's another group that's done a lot, especially if you're doing sort of, uh, you know, most people, it seems, have focused on Ubuntu, but uh, CentOS has been sort of championed by Mirantis. They've done a great job. And then the rest of these people on here are, are doing, they're either trying to build a service on OpenStack right now, or they are com committing, you know, Puppet and Opscode have recipes that they've released. There's a bunch of other rela uh, recipes or manifests that have been released by those communities. Uh, Dell has, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later too, but they have a tool called Crowbar that's pretty cool. Uh, Citrix has committed to an OpenStack distribution. Uh, NTT Data did some of the uh, IPv6 you know, cloud scaling and Stratus, right scale, Nebula, all these people are, are sort of coming together and working on this open project to build the next, you know, whatever, it, who, who knows where this is going to be, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the momentum of where we're at and how we got here. So these are just numbers I took from the OpenStack website. There's 110 companies. If you go to the website, click on it, you can see a bunch of logos, and that's, I feel like everything in the universe sort of has this power law distribution where you have, you know, a fat head and then a long tail, and if you look at those 110 companies, you know, the fat head is, you know, towards one end is Rackspace and, and Dell and Citrix and, you know, Piston Cloud Scaling, uh, Nebula, and then goes down to people that, you know, do all sorts of things, and that's another, I don't want to get too uh, sidetracked by some of the some of the politics, but there's, there's basically, you know, on one end, there's a bunch of people writing code, trying to make something happen, and then the long tail is uh, a lot of press releases. So <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just keep going from there. But there's service providers who are, I mean, I know personally there's over $50 million that's been put into companies that are trying to monetize some sort of OpenStack-based product. There's a bunch of interest from hardware vendors for obvious reasons. There's a bunch of service providers who are trying to kind of take their offering to the kind of the next level, and they realize that it's probably easier for them to, to leverage this community than to try to do this all by themselves. At the end of the day, uh, that, that creates a, a very interesting landscape. And I'll give uh, bonus points for whoever can put it to the, the group chat what this picture is from. But, you basically are seeing a proliferation of ideas about how to do some of this stuff. Uh, that's, that's reflected in the code so that you get a lot of ideas about how th these things should function and interact. And we'll go through a little bit more about what OpenStack actually is and what it does. And then, yes, Jeff Hobbs is correct. It is the Grand Bazaar in Turkey, it's, uh, if you've ever been there. Wherever you get a chance to go there, check it out. But you basically are going to get clouds of all shapes and sizes. And OpenStack is a framework that is attempting to provide you as, an, as a user, you as a, as a sysadmin, ways to address the needs. And 
that could be something on, on one end of the scale where, you know, you, you need to manage, or you, you know, you have 10 compute nodes and you're going to manage maybe 100 virtual machines to people who are trying, you know, they're spending literally millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars trying to provide services that are, you know, web scale or whatever that mean, word means to you. So I want to walk through the, the projects. There's, if you go to the website, openstack.org, it lists these three as the, as the main projects. If you're, I mean, I'm assuming there's a little bit of uh, vocabulary here. The infrastructure, the service, compute is the EC2, kind of EC2 defined this space. It's basically the easiest definition for me is I can make a web service call and I get back some indication that somewhere is a virtual machine with my name on it and then I can go and make it do whatever I want because I have the power. Object storage is essentially S3 or, or uh, Rackspace Cloud Files, which lets you store whatever arbitrary data in uh, over HTTP and then request it back over HTTP. So it's basically a way for you to put images somewhere or, or that could be images, that could be text, that could be whatever, and then get them back. And then Glance sort of grew out of, of uh, the need to solve this problem that you have a bunch of things you kind of need to keep track of, which is, you know, RAM disks and machine images, and Glance lets you hook up Swift. It also will support other backends and then feed that into Nova. And then it's also worth noting, especially with the, the newer release, that there's these other services that have kind of been promoted, and they're, I think they're actually going to become more and more important, which is Keystone providing a unified authentication service, and then the dashboard project, which we'll see a little bit later, which provides you, you know, kind of the, the front-end GUI experience uh, without some of the it's, it's kind of, if you've used EC2, it's, it's kind of like the, the website EC2 has that lets you look at images and it has a, a system kind of administrative side and it has a user dashboard that lets you look at images. Now this is, a, this is a, a call, call to arms because these projects clearly need logos. Uh, if, you go, if you go to Apache and you look at all the projects, most of them have really interesting and, and amazing logos, and OpenStack has one logo that's kind of this umbrella, and I think it would be really cool if there's a nice logo for each of these projects a year from now or three months from now or whatever. So that's a call to the community, so let's get some logos, all you artists. So this is not strictly true, but this is kind of a way to, there's a bunch of sort of sequence diagrams and interactions, um, but this is kind of a, a high-level architecture that gives you the story. So you have the Internet, you have a bunch of people on the Internet, and then you have these running services, and technically there's probably some cases where the users would touch Keystone too, but the unified authentication is provided by Keystone. Your dashboard is, like I said before, it's a UI. Nova is marshalling the resources required to provide virtual machines. Glance is loading the images, the machine images that are required to do that from Swift. That's kind of the, the high-level story. And then Swift itself has a lot of other use cases for serving whatever random files or static websites or you know, whatever you could use a, a HTTP-based key value store for, you can use Swift for. So I went and I did a little bit of uh, research to kind of give you guys an indication of the momentum of these projects. And this is, this is Nova. I don't know if you're familiar with the website, Olo, but it, if you're into open source, then it's kind of an interesting website. They do a bunch of uh, metrics on open source projects. So Nova, in the last 30 days, had 281,000 lines added 
and 121,000 lines removed from 42 committers. And if you go look back to the, if you look at the slope of that from the last release to now, Nova has basically doubled in, in size, lines of code, and you know, to, to a first approximation since the, the Cactus release. I, and I think that, I mean, that's very telling of, of what we saw, we talked about earlier, which is all the energy and, and resources being thrown into this project. And next, sorry for the dead air, Swift is basically a little more mature. It's been, it's, it's based off the Rackspace cloud files, and it's not seen as active uh, development, but part of that is because it's, it's much more mature, it's been running in production, and there's not as much being changed because it basically works. Then you have Glance. They didn't have an OLO, um, but just looking at it, it's look, you know, and this is looking at the GitHub and the, and the Git, but it's about half the size of Swift, more or less, and about twice as active right now. Dashboard is a smaller thing, but it's uh, pretty active. It's going to be, I, I think that the, you're going to see a lot of interesting uh, features come into the dashboard just because there, there's a lot of focus on it. And then Keystone, this authentication service is about half the size of Swift, but about twice as active. So that's kind of the, the overview of the momentum of this project. And that leads us to something that just happened, which is kind of a big deal. The Diablo release, which, like I said a minute ago, looks like, to a first approximation, roughly twice the code that was available for the Cactus release. And the, the convention that they're, they decide to follow is they're going to go in, in order of the alphabet, I believe. So the next one will be Essex, and then I don't know when, when we get to, to Z what we'll do, but that's, that's Diablo. It's... Uh, Pretty exciting. If you go to the website, I don't want to go through and read, read the, the laundry list because all this stuff's pretty uh, pretty visible. If you look at the blog, there's a bunch of announcements about what's in those releases. But it's uh, it's nice it's nice to see the momentum. And I just want to make a, a real quick comment here. If you've uh, if you've ever used Linux, you know, a modern version of Linux, it's pretty easy. You can uh, you can probably give your grandmother an Ubuntu CD and, and a laptop from wherever, anything made within the last three to five years, and she could have Ubuntu running on, uh, on a laptop without too much help from you, hopefully. My grandma probably could. And that's, that's a great story, but if you look at what it was like to use, to use Linux, say, 1995, then, then that story was very different. You know, before you have the rise of, of the distributions and the proliferation of the, the package management and, and the modern ideas that we kind of take for granted, if you wanted to run Linux, you basically had to be an expert in hardware. You had to know C. You had to be willing to have the thing blow up and then rebuild it and kind of go through that. And I think we're, we're sort of in that that transitional phase where you have, you have an opportunity to use OpenStack, but at the same time, OpenStack is not going to solve all these other hard problems for you. You know, eventually, I think that they will be solved through that same sort of mechanism of distributions, and, and you're seeing some of that happen right now. I don't know. There, I, I expect to see more and more of these, but earlier this week there was the, the announcement from Piston that they're, that they're doing a the distribution. We already saw it. Uh, Project Olympus from Citrix, and we'll just, I think you're going to see a, a proliferation of those types of, of kind of vendor-supported distributions that have made um, some of those choices for you, collapsed some of the complexity, uh, and, and allowed you to deal with, with that kind of happy path installation they're going to give you. But then again, just like Linux now, if you want things to be working a certain way, you're kind of left up to do that on your own. Also, honestly, each one of these services that we just kind of walk through is probably by itself worthy of at least an hour. And, and frankly, some of them 
you could probably spend a good week in a class all day and, and you know, learn and, and never stop learning. There, there's, there's just a lot of depth to what it's required to actually deploy and make some of these decisions and weigh this, this, uh, this complexity, the uh, combinatorics. If you look at what's supported in NOVA right now, and you try to try to, I mean, this is this is actually impacting the project when you think about the the functional testing and the and the continuous integration. There's a there's a Jenkins site, but to to actually test the combinatoric matrix of all those features and how they interact with each other is not a solved problem. So I'm going to wager that most people are actually most interested. In Nova, you know, clearly that you know if you're going to run it a certain way, then that's going to start to get into Glance and Swift as well. But it seems when most people talk about clouds, they're mostly interested in infrastructure as service. If I, uh, you know, maybe uh, John out there somewhere, Chuck, they're more interested in Swift, and I probably know more about Swift than I do Nova if I'm telling the truth. But I think most of you guys are interested in infrastructure service. So this is, uh, I asked Jesse Andrews, who's the, the head of Rackspace Cloud Builders, last night what his favorite architecture diagram for Nova was, and he pointed me to this slide. And this is actually a Ken Peppel slide from the O'Reilly book, then modified for another presentation uh, that, that Mr. Lindsay did that has all the, you know, it's a distributed architecture. So if you kind of look at the, the image and map that back to the other, you know, simplified version, this is with the exception of the, the grayed out or the, you know, the, the grayer parts, the, the Nova architecture. So Nova by itself has a bunch of moving parts. So you have the dashboard, which is, I guess, technically a separate project now, so then maybe that could be grayed out too. They have the Nova API, which is providing an endpoint, and that's, that's actually the kind of the public facing service that everyone's going to go through. And then everything, if, if you look at the queue right here in this picture, the, the canonical installation is using RabbitMQ, but there's been some work done that in the future there's, there's possible, uh, the possibility to implement some other types of queues with some abstraction, so maybe uh, some sort of uh, zero MQ or, or other implementation. And then if you look at the rest of these, you're, you're basically passing messages asynchronously back and forth with the queue and these services, and these services are responsible for coordinating with the abstractions of the different resources. And it's pretty easy to figure out what each one does based on its name. So Nova Compute is essentially keeping track of and and marshalling the compute resources. Nova Network is probably, I, I think you're going to see a lot of active development in the, the models and the complexity of Nova Network, but it's essentially responsible for keeping the, the state and the resources for how the VMs are interacting with the network. And then the volume is, like you'd imagine, and you can kind of see from the slide, allowing you to attach to uh, the way that the documents describe it, it's, it's like a USB uh, stick. Uh, it's sort of a e uh, EBS equivalent, um, although that's a hard problem, and there's a bunch of hard problems in, in how you're going to do storage. We'll, we'll kind of talk about that at a high level later. And then Nova Schedule, I think there's also some interesting operational research problems that could be solved in, in Nova Scheduler. It's basically taking and keeping track of how all these images and you know disks and, and network resources are being allocated and trying to optimize them. So there's kind of a simple way to do that, and then there's there's more complex ways. Um, there's there's a random approach, but if you really think about how this kind of plays out at scale and with a lot of different uh, possible possible configurations for disks and RAM, then the, the bin packing problem or the operational research problem of, of how you're going to optimize that infrastructure, if you can get, you know, if, at a, if you're randomly putting stuff in and you have 15, 20% waste and you can get that another 10% out of that, then that might be worth 
uh, quite a bit to you if you're running this at high scale. So it will be interesting to see how that part evolves as well. So if you're a developer and you want to get involved, I think that the, the fastest way to onboard is this DevStack project that the Rackspace Cloud Builders put together. And it's essentially an opinionated shell script that will install every project from source, start all of the services in a screen session. If, who's familiar with screen? If you're not using screen or Tmux, then you should start now because it will change your life. But it will run all the different services in a screen session, and then you can see you know, basically the impact of making your changes. Right now it's basically running uh, the Diablo release. I think it, it, this will evolve. I know uh, Jesse and those guys have, have good plans for it, and they're, they're actually using this as their preferred way to kind of bring up their own development stack. And I think if we, if we as a community of developers get to the point where there's, there's kind of a canonical way to, to develop and, and you can onboard developers with, with sort of a standard way to get those services up and running, then it will accelerate the, the code even, even more. And so I think that's a pretty cool project. If you go to devstack.org and kind of look at the documents or you can clone it on GitHub, then you can walk through that shell script and you can see how it clones or, or how, it, how it, you know, it's basically going to clone a bunch of repos and then configure them. And the, you know, the default is to run it in a single VM. And then the, the way that you can configure it, there's, it's a little bit ar arcane right now, but I'm sure Jesse would be happy to uh, tell you more about it. It will it, it, actually support, you know, through manipulating some of the environment variables, a multi-node deployment if you want to develop against a multi-node as well. And then moving on, so that's kind of a way to get to, get to uh, develop it. Now you can run that on a single bare metal machine or you can run that on a VM. I've, I was actually playing with it yesterday using Vagrant, which is another tool. Uh, Vagrantup.org is a, is a great resource. I'll dump that in the chat. Vagrant, do it. And Vagrant is a way, it, the way I think of Vagrant, this is sort of a, an aside, but Vagrant is a tool that lets you kind of think about VMs like you think about a make file or, or making a project. So you, you can do Vagrant up and get a virtual machine that you know is clean and in the state of whatever the base box that you're using, and then you, you, you can, it can tie into Puppet or Chef or Shell provisioners and do a bunch of magic. And then when you test whatever you want to test, you can bring it down. So if you're developing these kind of configuration management or these kind of uh, deployment scenarios, Vagrant is, is your friend. Sometimes it's a little frustrating because it moves super fast. Um, that, that could probably be said about some of the OpenStack stuff. So whenever the virtual box changes or the gems change, then, then you're going to look at some Ruby stack traces for a minute. But if, you, if you're cognizant and, and you're actually understanding what, what you want to accomplish, Vagrant will be your friend and you won't look back after you've used it a few times. So you really want to build a cloud. Uh, what does that mean? I mean, the promise of cloud is that you don't actually have to deal with servers, but that's kind of a, that's kind of a lie. And the truth is, the truth is that in the last year of trying uh, to build cloud infrastructure and working on putting together some of these deployments, the, I learned more about servers and network gear and disks and the drivers for JBot enclosures and all this kind of stuff than I ever wanted to know about. So it's kind of the dirty little secret that at the bottom of this, there has to be some metal and there has to be a bunch of stuff and it has to be powered and it has to be cooled. And it's one thing, you know, you, like I said before, on, on one end you want to bring up Nova in, in a VM and run it and see how it works and, you know, see the dashboard and that's kind of cool. On the other hand, if you get to the point where you actually want to run this as scale as a service, it's a hard problem. And I remember, I remember that I saw the eucalyptus uh, announcement at Velocity in 2008, 
And, and kind of the dream that was being told then is you have a bunch of this hardware laying around and you're just going to add it to your cloud and it's going to work. And it turns out that I think that that's probably a recipe for a lot of pain. And if you're actually going to go and build a service or build anything with any real complexity or scale, then you should think long and hard about how you can minimize variation across all the <laughs> all the different parts of the of the servers and the disk. If you have if you if you put that together and it's a, a heterogeneous environment, then you're going to you're going to look like this guy. And if you're if you're coming from a place that runs a gear like this, then you're probably going to have a problem too. So people people are looking for the cloud secret. I can see. Uh, Gary Griswold is looking for the cloud secret. But there's no secret. There's a bunch of super hard storage and networking problems, and there's a bunch of compromises that you're going to make. So if you're going to build open source clouds and you're not going to think about each of these sort of trade-offs, then they're going to be made accidentally. At the bottom, while Nova Network is giving you an abstraction that lets you manage some of these resources, the choice of how you configure the actual gear and how that's set up and how that interacts with the Nova software is going to, the complexity and the, and the problems that you're going to work through in doing that. Right now, like I said before, it's kind of like the Linux early days. You have a bunch of ideas, you have a bunch of things, but it's sort of like you're going to be troubleshooting the drivers to get that stuff to work. And then storage, if you've ever if you've ever used Amazon and you've depended on EBS and then, and then come to regret it, then you probably understand at least, I mean, if you think about the, the organization that, that Amazon has built and how they got to the point where they're at and the fact that they, they can't solve that problem in a, in a performant and reliable way should tell you that it's hard. So if you don't want to listen to this, that's fine. I'm trying to save you some, some pain later. Now, there's a bunch of other nice tools kind of in this ecosystem. If you're going to actually build a cloud that you're going to run at scale, then you're, you know, the story is there's commodity hardware, there's, there's commodity hardware, and it's built for failure. Well, that means that you're actually, you know, at some scale expecting servers and disk and these kind of things to fail every day. So how do you, how do you add capacity or how do you replace capacity? So one of the problems that you need to solve is a bare metal provisioning problem, which is pixie booting. Um, it's the, the basics of it are, are fairly well understood. In practice, uh, I think that there's still a lot of interesting uh, problems that could be solved better. And you know, you're basically going to have images, TFTP, DHCP, things boot, magic happens. This is a really cool project that's sort of part of that ecosystem. Dell that I was telling you about. It's uh, Yes, XCAT, XCAT is actually a great tool from the chat. Uh, I think there's some things that could probably – XCAT tries to do a lot of things just like Crowbar tries to do a lot of things. I don't necessarily like every choice Crowbar's made, but it's giving you uh, some very interesting functionality where you can, you can pixie boot, and then it's also got a chef server as part of, the, as part of that uh, Crowbar. And then you can associate through some interesting logic and, and these things called bar clamps, you can associate and actually inspect. So you can inspect the, the hardware that's available and then make decisions about what should be running there. So if you have something that's got a bunch of disks on it, you're probably going to want to run Swift on that. If you have something that's uh, you know, CPU and RAM heavy, then it lets you, you know, through, the, through the profile of the, the bar clamps, choose what chef recipes get installed. And, and Crowbar by itself is a very interesting project. It also tries to do some monitoring stuff, but you could spend another easily a week talking about the configuration and the configuration management tools. And you know, my background coming from the Puppet side and then also you know, being involved, I've, I've probably written more chef code in the last year than I have Puppet code, but I, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with both of these tools and how they use them. And if you're, if you're a sysops uh, person, even if you're 
you know, just kind of interested in cloud, then that's one thing. But if you actually have servers that you need to maintain and configure, I, I highly recommend that you check out uh, these types of tools. There's some other ones that are interesting also, um, but this kind of seems to be the, the leaders in, in especially the OpenStack community, and both of these companies have, have devoted resources to providing sort of the manifest and the, and the recipes to make this stuff. Palette is an, is an awesome tool as well. Uh, this basically gives you the abstraction to configure machines based on the things that a sysadmin would already think about. So you have things like mount points and interfaces and packages and users, and you, you compose those in, in classes of services. So you have things like your database service or your Nova network service or whatever. And you can go see, if you go on GitHub right now and search for OpenStack, you're going to find uh, Manifest for Puppet, Cookbooks for Puppet. The, there's cookbooks from the, the, the Cloud Builders for Puppet. There's um, Opscode has a bunch of um, OpenStack cookbooks. It's, just, it's sort of a, you know, kind of another layer to this community that lets you, that lets you deploy and manage those, those systems. And like literally you could, you could do a week of, of training on just this topic. And not only do you need to configure, if you're actually going to build services for your, for your company or you know, for, for uh, some other goal, then the configuration of the actual bare metal resources you have to solve, and that's going to be all those other services we sort of saw before. You have the, you know, the networking and the, the rest of the stuff for Nova, plus Plants, plus Swift, what have you. But you also have a bunch of VMs now. So you're you know, ostensibly going from, say, 10, you know, maybe hundreds of bare metal to 10 times that number of, real, uh, of virtual machines, and those also need to be configured. So this, this type of uh, – this tool will change your life. Even if you don't adopt one of these tools, there's a bit of a learning curve. Just the mindset of thinking about idempotent resources and how you can apply them and what you need to do will, will change the way you manage systems, I guarantee it. And then I, I'm going to keep using this slide until people actually get it, because no one seems to. But you basically have these things that you need to provide to have a reliable service. And this is Joe Armstrong. He wrote a, a programming language called Erlang. Which, and some of this, these ideas are built into that virtual machine. Right now, if you're running uh, OpenStack, I feel like you basically need to kind of bring your own on, on some of these other things. So if you're trying to build a service at scale or, or even that you want to run reliably, then there's a lot of this stuff around the edges that you need to solve. Um, the monitoring, you know, there's going to be more and more. I, I just saw some, some work Thanos did. Um, some of the community stuff will probably start to grow in that area. But, but for now, if you're trying to, you know, and, and I speak from experience having tried to run this stuff, you're going to need to solve these problems. And it's not going to be something that you get for free, at least not yet. Which brings me to this next slide, which is right now, um, I, I didn't want to do any complicated buildings with this tool, but you basically have sort of this kernel in the center, which is OpenStack, and it's brokering compute network and storage, which is if you think about how, how a kernel works, it's essentially the same kind of model. You have compute network and storage resources that are, that are exposed to you through the abstractions of the kernel. But then all this other stuff that you're going to need. So, so right now, if you want to build an OpenStack-based service, you're going to need monitoring and management. You're going to need to solve these deploy problems. And it's not just the deployment. So there was a... There was an article in a discussion about uh, Krishnan from, from Cloud Avenue was talking about how, how the deployment of OpenStack is, is easy. And that's, that's only seeing like the static picture, in my opinion. And if you really look at what is going on in cloud and why, why the, the advantages that Amazon has are allowing them to do some of the things they're doing in this market, it's really not about some of the features. It's about the operations. And operations, there's, a, there's an article in, uh, we'll, we'll reference O'Reilly, O'Reilly Radar, which is operations is, is the secret sauce to startups. And I really believe that's true. And if, if it wasn't true, you know, if these weren't hard problems, then I think you'd already see some of these OpenStack-based services. I know there's a bunch of people working on this. Like we, we talked before, there's a bunch of resources 
they're being put into this problem, but at, at the end of the day, I can't go right now putting a credit card and launch uh, a VM on, on an OpenStack-based service. You know, there's been, there's been a lot of movement, and, and I'm, I'm excited, and I know some people are working very hard to make that happen, but it's still, it's still something that will be in the future, and it's not, it's not the reality today. So all the rest of this stuff we're starting to see come on. Billing, if you're going to actually charge and build a service, even if you're going to just do simple chargebacks inside of your, of your company, you have, to, you have to do non-trivial work to, to integrate the billing. And that's, that's also not a solved problem. That might be a good idea for a startup. I don't know. So let's, uh, let's see if we can do a demo. So this, I'm going to show the OpenStack dashboard, and I'm going to try to, this is, this is um, a, a cluster that is donated from the Rackspace cloud builders, thank them, and I'm going to share the screen, and then I'll just kind of show you some of the, this is the dashboard if you ran if you go and run the, the dev stack script right now, then you'll have running this dashboard on whatever VM or, or machine. And you can, you can kind of play with it from there too. I'm not going to say there won't, there won't be issues because right now it's running uh, the head, but let's try this and see how it goes. So if I log in, then I will have an overview. Right now there says so there's no instances on this page. This would show me all the running instances. This has a list of the images that are currently available. So there's a Natty instance, which we'll use in a minute. There's also built-in functionality to take snapshots. And then if you're familiar with the way this whole, this whole game works on Amazon, you can set up key pairs. Floating IPs is a, is a way we will we'll look at this in a minute. I don't, have any, I don't have any floating IPs, which is different than I thought. Hold on. Sorry. If it gets clumsy. I'd like, uh, we're, we're going to have probably another 15 minutes for so if you guys can start throwing questions into there. I, I saw a question earlier about the hardware required, and if someone in the, in the audience would like to answer that question, that would be one thing. But from my perspective, that's, a, that's an open question. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. What are your requirements? What are you actually trying to, to do? If you, have, if you have a bunch of, uh, you know, services they're trying to consolidate, then that's one thing. If you have a, if you're trying to build a service that's uh, web scale, then that's another. You can run it on one, one VM. All right, so let's go to the user dashboard and start one. Sorry for the dead air. So these are, this is an instance that's running right now. I'm going to go to the images. I'm going to launch an Ubuntu image. I'm going to get a little user data. Hold on. Don't ask all those questions at once. This is why live demos are such a great idea. All right, user data. So that will just change the password so we can log on to it without having the key set up. And then we'll do that and we'll make it a small 
and then we will launch it. It's launching success. We have a VM. Now the way that this, this configuration works, I should have a floating IP. I'm not sure why I don't. So I will call tech support. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, question. Puppet versus Chef. I'll, I'll ask, uh, I have uh, hopefully some help from the, the Rackspace guys. Why don't, I thought I would have a, a public IP, and what I want to try to do is launch a VM that I did already, and then I can, I can VNC into that, get a console, and I was going to install Apache and then give you guys the IP address to show that it works. So hopefully we could do that in the next 10 minutes. In the meantime, I'm going to answer these questions. So we have Puppet versus Chef, uh, strengths versus weaknesses of each. That is an interesting question. I've tried to answer that. I kind of got, uh, I, I won't say baited, but there's, there's a Quora discussion on this topic where I wrote a good uh, two, three pages on this. But the, the main thing I would say is the worldview where you have Puppet has a very strict notion of what the model is. It also wants to, it doesn't necessarily force you, but it, it strongly encourages you to have a much more kind of centralized notion um, where Chef is a bit more, um, allows for a bit more procedural thought. And that is, it's, this is going to sound basically philosophical, and I think that's where, where it breaks down. But you kind of have the, the dichotomy between what, is it, what does it mean to do and what does it mean to be? So what Puppet wants you to do is specify things declaratively, what their end state is, and then Puppet as a framework tries to make that all happen, although there are things which, because of the nature of configuration and the way these machines work, you're kind of forced to color outside the lines and deal with some procedural issues anyway. And, and Chef has some of the same ideas about item potency, but doesn't necessarily give you that sort of, it doesn't force you as strongly to, to make things declarative. So that may or may not make sense to you if you're steeped in the, the mythology of configuration management, it did, but if it, if it didn't, then I, I suggest read the Quora post or send me an email and I, I'd be happy to discuss it more. So let's see, who does OpenStack so right now there is both an EC2 API and an OpenStack API. And there is a bit of a lag, and it, it's, um, it's an interesting kind of thread to follow in the, in the community development process, how those APIs are evolving. And, and, and I think there's another interesting aspect there because you don't know what's tested or, or not in terms of, of the IP and what they can, uh, what they can protect. All right. So let, I'm going to try allocate IP. I was told to just try it. Okay. So I'm going to allocate this IP to my instance. We're going to keep doing this, and I'll, I'll keep trying to answer questions too. So I'm associating my IP. So now I have a successfully associated IP. I'll go back to this instance, talk you through that, and then we will start this thing while I answer the next question. So someone tossed out palette. It's another option. Palette is, a, is an awesome uh, project along the same um, kind of spirit as Puppet and Chef. Uh, slightly different philosophically, but it's, uh, it's written in Lisp or, or Clojure, where uh, both Puppet and Chef are written in um, Ruby. So if you're coming from a background where you prefer JVM languages or you prefer Lisp, then, then Palette is an awesome option. Um, it's it's uh, a little bit a smaller community and, and a little less uh, rich functionally, but it's, it's, an, it's an awesome uh, project. Okay, so Darren Daggs asks, can you detail some of the network issues you're alluding to? What is planned to improve the network capabilities of OpenStack Nova? So if you go read the documentation, there's actually several different networking models that are supported. 
And there's also a, I, I don't know what the right word is, but there, there is a community of people, some of them vendors, some of them um, operators who are exploring different kind of network as a service abstractions. And I think you're going to see some of the most active development in the networking uh, in, in the next year. So I don't know exactly, I mean, I, that's probably another hour long discussion to go through some of these issues, but right now you basically are going to choose different um, formats for the different types of management of IPs. And you know you have you have a DHC, flat DHCP and and ways to set up VLANs and each of those kind of creates different different trade-offs and and features. And then you ask a typical use case for Swift and Glance. So Glance, it, the 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 reason you would use Glance, the use case for Glance is to provide images for. I'm going to keep trying to type while I do this for the Nova, and then Swift is the backing store to put those images. So we're talking about machine images. And then you could also use Swift. I know um, one of the projects I've worked on, they have a Swift installation. It's a pretty big cluster, about a petabyte of storage, and they're using it um, as an origination server for a CDN, as well as, so they, they don't actually use Glance or any of the, or the or Nova right now, but they use Swift to um, Originates and serve for the CDN, and then they, they serve content directly from Swift. So it's basically a way for you to associate uh, whatever whatever undifferentiated bits with some sort of uh, key, and then you you request. It's it's a simple key value store, which is in in, a, in essence RAM is a simple key value store. It's pretty pretty simple idea. You you have some symbol, and then you have some data. And you put the data in with the symbol, and you get it back out. So you can just think of this big distributed hash. Let's do this. So I'm going to do app get update because that's what all good systems do. And then let's see. Keep reading. QA. All right. You, were met, you mentioned a number of updates were being performed against Nova. Could you highlight the area where these updates are being made? What areas need the most work? Um, if, you, if you were here earlier when I was showing the, the stats for the project, um, I would say that it's grown, it's, it's basically doubled in size in the last six months, and then the, the majority, if you count the lines created and the lines deleted, um, large, large chunks of Nova have actually been evolved and rewritten. And I would say that the areas that need the most work, I mean, if you really want to get involved with the project, there's, there's a list of issues on Launchpad, and there's a list of, of all these things. But if you, if you really understand networks, if you really understand storage, if you really like programming in Python, there's almost an unlimited amount of work for you to do right now. And if you want a job, you send me an email, I bet I could find something for you to do. So I don't know if there's a, there's an area that needs the most work. You know, if uh, Jesse or, or some of the cloud builders are in the are in the chat and want to dump an answer to that there, then I'm sure you have a better perspective than I do. All right, now I'm going to install patching. And I'm sorry for the crappy JavaScript DNC artifacts. Apache is installing. Who does open? Okay, that we already answered the APIs. Has anyone written a GUI front end for managing Swift, i.e., add and removing accounts and containers, and for that matter, any front ends to the Swift files? There's, I know some that have been written um, that are not open right now because of you know some of the projects that I, I worked on. There's a the dashboard that, that, I'm, that I was demoing, that I am demoing, actually has a Swift integration as well. That's not, that's not installed or, or turned on on the one that I have here, but there is, there is that. And, and actually the Swift APIs, they're not that complicated. And if you're familiar with you know, the, the API, you could, you could probably have a dashboard that does some of that stuff written in you know, Rails or Django or something in, 
I mean, for first first pass, you could probably have it in a couple of days, afternoon. All right. Is there an appliance ecosystem around OpenStack today? So I could launch an instance that has a network device, such as a firewall or a load balancer. Um, yes, ish and no ish. Um, I would uh, I would defer to I know I know there's some stuff kind of in the works for that, and there's been some work on if you go if you go to the the page for the project, one of the one of the sub projects that's not kind of an elevated first first level project is called Atlas, which is a load balancer as a service. Um, that's trying to do integrations to to manage some of the load balancing stuff. I think that's you know in addition to the networking work, how we're going to do load balancing and try to do some of the kind of ELB type stuff is uh, is interesting. All right, let's see. So we should have a. I think that should work. Let's close this. So you guys should. So I just I just launched the VM, put on a public interface, installed Apache, and then you should be able to see with the IP address I just dumped in the chat room that the Apache was successfully installed. All right. Question: Can it provision storage devices? If yes, how many types of storage devices does it support? I think the right answer there is probably no in, in terms of the devices, but the way that the, the Nova volumes or what you need to do um, to set up the actual storage, um, you, you would expose something like iSCSI or, or you know whatever the, the other. There's a couple of options if you go look at the way that works. So I would say that um, in terms of provisioning storage devices, the answer is probably no. Um, in terms of the protocols and, and the types of storage devices to support, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a few, and then it could be implemented. There, that, that's one place I think you'll see a lot of active development as well. All right. Is there any identified bottlenecks within OpenStack at the moment? The queue system seems a possible candidate, for instance, do you have any real-world data of deployed OpenStack instances? So, Gildas, the queue obviously could be a bottleneck at the scale that I've seen, which is you know hundreds to low thousands of nodes. That queue is not really a problem, at least not yet. And then there's also the possibility to abstract the queue service and do things with maybe zero MQ or, or something else. Um, if that if that you know brokered brokered approach becomes a bottleneck, I think that another way to do that is at the level where you're having the the queue, which is essentially your control backplane. And if if your if your if your control plane is, is congested, then you probably did something wrong. Um, then then you can split things into zones. So at the you know, if you think about the way Amazon's presenting their infrastructure right now with the different availability zones and regions, then there's probably some practical limit to the way they've implemented things scaling, and that helps them to decide, um, you know, the size of those zones. And I think you're going to see that same sort of thing. Right now I don't have really good data about the, the top end of that, and of course it's going to depend a lot on your use case. So the way that you use the infrastructure is going to have a big impact on the way that the, those underlying services hit that queue. And Darren Daggs asks, do you feel OpenStack is better served on top of KVM or Zen? Uh, that's a loaded question like the Puppet Chef one. Um, I think that of the available options for hypervisors, that those are the two that make the most sense. So there's, if you read the list of support, there's a bunch of other, there's a bunch of other Hypervisors that are theoretically supported, but, but realistically, I think it comes down to a choice between KVM or Zen, and it's a this a, a debated topic as well. But I, I think that you know, kind of looking at some of the things that are going on, you know, KVM seems to be a little more forward-looking, and Zen seems to be a little bit um, more mature. Um, 
for whatever value mature and whatever that word means to you. So that's kind of how I would, you know, try to politically correct, correctly uh, give you that answer. Yeah, it's probably worth mentioning, uh, thanks Jess, that there's active IRC channels. Um, all these things are being discussed every day. There's also a mailing list. And, you know, I see Ann, Ann Gentle's in here answering questions here. She's uh, in charge of the, the documentation for the, the project, and I'm sure she would, as much as there's an opportunity to get involved and help write code, there is a ton of documentation. It seems like in open source projects, documentation always, always lags implementation, so I'm sure she would take any volunteer um, effort to, to help write documentation. And, and it's getting better and better all the time. So that seems like a, a lull. Are there any more questions or anyone uh, questions, comments, or war stories? Yeah, it absolutely needs improvement, but you should have seen the first release. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, uh, I mean, having been part of different open source communities, and you know, struggled with this as part of you know personally part of the puppet community. It's uh, you know you always want to do the code, you always want to make that better, and then it's for some reason I don't know why developers don't just love writing documentation. It's crazy. I think uh, that's probably the end of the webcast. We got to the end of our hour. I I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Like I said at the outset, I'm not sure I'm going to. Uh, do much more than, than save you a, a couple of hours of reading so that you could do, uh, you know, another hundred or so. And thank you for your time, and uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed it.